This morning, my message is titled, Forgiveness is Crucial. Forgiveness is Crucial. Matthew 18, 21 to 22, I'm using the ESV. I usually use NKJV, but today I just want to use the ESV for this particular topic. It says, then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. If my math is correct, that is 490 times. I want to see who's going to be counting because I'm waiting for somebody to say, Pastor, I've so forgiven him 490, so now can I kill him? <laughs> but Jesus is not talking about the figure or the number and, and this is interesting on many fronts and this is why forgiveness is crucial. If there was anyone that knew Jesus, it was Peter. Because Peter was his disciple. Peter was with Jesus. Peter walked with Jesus. Peter was the rock on which Jesus was going to build the church. And so what I'm saying to you is that if you are confused about forgiveness, you are not alone because Peter was confused too. If you are still holding unforgiveness in your heart, because I don't think Peter just asked that question in abstract. Maybe John had been pissing him off. And he was thinking, maybe I don't want to forgive John because John knows better. Maybe Matthew or Thomas, the doubter, had been challenging him. And he has been saying, you know something, let me go and ask the master one time. And he was hoping that Jesus would say, once you are forgiving him seven times, and John may have been on number seven. So Peter was ready to do what he had to do. But Jesus, who is our guide, and this is the challenge we have as Christians, even today in a politically toxic environment, I don't hate people that have a different political view to mine. I feel that they are wrong, but their being wrong doesn't rise to the level of hatred. This is why if you are a Pentecostal church so-called evangelist or evangelical Christian and you don't like people because of the color of their skin, you don't say it, but you know in your heart you don't, then you are not a Christian. If you can't forgive somebody for what you say they did, then you are not following the Jesus that you use his name. Stop calling yourself a Christian if you are not willing to follow Christ. Being a Christian means you are a follower of Christ. And Christ was answering Peter and teaching us in Matthew chapter 18 verses 21 to 22. He says we must forgive Seven times, 70 times. That means it's 490 times per incident. Not 490 times in your life. This is how you can excel in life. This is how you can live in the open heavens. I bring two days ago, the general overseer was saying, unforgiveness is like you are poisoning yourself. There are so many people that have not been able to move ahead with their lives. I use marriage as an example. When I practiced law, I didn't, I didn't do divorce a lot, but I, 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 I flirted in certain situations. And I, I got to see people, even in just regular transactions, the hatred they have for their spouse is so terrible that you know that it is poisonous to them. The man was so wicked. The woman was so evil. And you divorced them 10 years ago. And you are still speaking about them as if your divorce was yesterday. You are so angry. You've not been able to move forward. Your parents, they hurt you so deeply that you can't. If you just think of them, that person could have a heart, heart attack or cardiac arrest. You are poisoning yourself. Because unfortunately, the people that you are upset with may not even know. That ex-husband may have married another wife and he's somewhere in, on the Bahamas enjoying himself and you are. That's not what God wants for us. 
Forgiveness is crucial in Christianity. Let's go a little deeper. Ephesians 4.32 Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. You cannot be a Christian and have unforgiveness in your heart. You can call yourself a Christian, but Jesus is telling us that we must forgive 70 times, 7 times per incident. So keep a log. Buy a book. When your pastor offends, you write offense number one. When I offend you again, right now. When you get to 489 or 4, forget yeah, 489, tell me. Then I will stop. So we can reset and we start again. It doesn't work. What Jesus is saying is that you must forgive. If you don't want to follow Christ, you don't have to forgive. Somebody said, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. The wickedness in this world stems from unforgiveness. You cannot be a Christian and not love. The Bible says you must love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, with all your strength. And then you must now love your fellow man as yourself. This is why marriages are in trouble because we refuse to forgive. Forgiveness is a one-way street. It's not a two-way street. That means even if the other person is not sorry for what they did, you must forgive them for your own sake. The Bible says that we must be kind to one another. When you are in a relationship, if you are kind to your spouse, it says you must be tender-hearted. That means you must be conscious of what you are doing that offends them. Stop saying, oh, she's a witch. He's a wizard. Uh, he, we, we are talking to you about mending your marriage, mending your relationship. You say, pastor, she will never change. And most of the people that have conflicts, whether in marriage or in relationships with their parents or with somebody else, they refuse to change because they are saying, until you change, I will not change. I've seen situations where people offended each other. We said, okay, call him and apologize. Say, no, pastor, no, 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 no. If she does not come to my house and apologize, then when we say come, you say, no, if she does not kneel down. When she kneel down, if she does not roll on, the, uh, you, have no, you are not going anywhere. You want the person to grovel before you. Meanwhile, many of us, as we sin against God, and if we even realize, we just say, Father, forgive me. You know, I'm just a man of flesh. This is the last time. If you get me out of this, even thieves, even thieves, I saw a, a, this video where the thief broke into a place and they locked the door on him. And he couldn't come out. He was banging the door. I can imagine the thief say, God, just help me to escape this last time. I will not steal a gun. And maybe God will allow. And he will make a way of escape. Next month, he's now taking guns with him. Say, next time I won't get into this kind of... And God may even forgive him again. And that same thief will find someone else who has offended them and they will not forgive until they take their pound of flesh. Forgiveness is crucial. God is commanding us. It's not, it's not a choice. He says, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Ephesians 4.32 Mark 11.25, please note these scriptures. Mark 11.25. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your father also who is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. This is the key in this message. I won't take a long time. 
When you forgive someone, you are helping yourself. I know it's painful and I know it's difficult. It's actually unnatural to forgive. Do you notice that even people that watch boxing and wrestling, wrestling is fake, boxing and um, MMA, that one is terrible. If you watch MMA or whatever, all these things, mixed martial arts and all that, those things, you start getting excited when they were beating some guy in the beginning, then he starts beating the other guy back. That makes us happier. Why? Because there's a natural instinct in, our, in us to want to inflict pain when somebody seems to have done something. So let's say somebody's losing, and that's why people love some, the people that follow sports. You love the underdog. There are some people, that's all they like. Who is the NBA champion now? Okay, so if some other team like Brooklyn Nets, who I think can't even win a title for, for if, they, if they give it to them, if Brooklyn Nets went to, fire, to play against the Lakers, maybe 40% of the people would just support Brooklyn Nets. Not because they like Brooklyn Nets, but don't mind those bloody Lakers. They think, you know, do you get what I'm saying? And they did not know harm to them. It's just an instinct in man. So that's why when you become a Christian, you are no longer physical. You are spiritual. You are a spiritual being. It's not normal. If you are normal, you are not a Christian. And that's where the difficulty is. That's where fellowshipping with God is important. That's where faith is built by hearing. Hearing the word of God. That is why what goes into you is important. It's not just all these people, all these races, all these people that are evil to black people, all these police officers that are killing people, and those people that are justifying the killing of black people, they, they, they go to church, many of them. Some of them are even knights and um, whatever. They have titles. They carry the cross in their processions. Even the KKK, they consider themselves to be Christians. But they don't know God. They have a religion that's like a sports club. They just support their team. But God's team is humanity. It's not religion. It's God. This is why Jesus himself was not accepted by the religious people. Because they understood the law. They loved the beauty of wearing the suit and tie, of having the big lapels and having the cross and having the incense. They loved the attention. Pastor, God, God bless you, Pastor. Oh, Pastor is coming. Pastor is coming. Pastor. They loved that attention. Everybody loved, oh, bless you. Bless you, my son. They love it, but their hearts, Bible said, is like a filthy sepulcher. That they are, they are, the inside of them is like a tomb. That when you whitewash and you paint some people, when you go to a graveyard, they have these beautiful, beautiful graves. But inside that grave, no matter how beautiful, is rotten bones. So Jesus was saying that these guys are like a filthy sepulcher. The inside of them is dirty, filled with maggots and worms and a rotten body. But the outside of the tomb is beautiful. Are you a Christian in name only? If you don't forgive, if you are not tender hearted, it's, it doesn't matter. You know, a lot of people say, Pastor, you don't understand. You, you don't understand. If you know what she did to me, if you know what he did to me, if you hold on to that, then you are ruining your own life. I remember a case long time ago. Some people came to my office. This man was married to a woman for many years, I think maybe 20 years. They had three children. The long and short of the story is what 20 years into the marriage, the man discovered that all three children were not his. All three children belonged to the woman's uncle, who was never her uncle, that the man was even helping, and the man even helped the man to come to America. When somebody explains that kind of story to you that the 18 year old child that he has brought up all his life is not his biological child. The 16 year old is not his biological child. 
and the 15 year old is not his biological child and to make it worse the man that was responsible for this he was helping the man and believing and telling his wife no 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 that's your uncle you have to do this and they were playing this game with him that's horrible that man ought not to forgive all of them in fact by natural justice he should kill the, man, the other man and maybe kill his wife but you know what will happen after he kills them he will go to jail for life now he has shut off his own life right even in the secular world because of that anger and unforgiveness what they did was awful what they did was terrible But there are stories of that kind of situation where the man said, you, you know something? Okay, I'm done. But these children that I've been bringing up all my life, they are still my kids. I'm going to look after them. I'm going to continue. Some of you are saying, Pastor, oh, that doesn't make any sense. But there are people that have done it. I showed you a video here once where a woman, her only child and son was shot by another man. And the man was sentenced to jail. And she started communicating with him in jail. Why did you do this? It's so terrible. You are such a wicked. And they started communicating and communicating. And after some time, she started to lead this boy to Christ. She didn't know what happened. She said she couldn't just understand. And then she led him to Christ. And then when they were going to parole this guy, they said, we need somebody to stand for him to come and give, like, you know, character witness or whatever. And this woman, whose only son was killed by him, she went and she petitioned and fought for him to be released. And guess what happened? When they released the boy, she took him in. This is not Apostle Paul. This is not James. This is somebody living in the United States of America like you and I. I remember when just a few years ago when they call us savage. You see, I'm so into this. If you don't understand that you must stop allowing people to label you wrongly because of the color of your skin, you are doing a disservice to your children. So you are, anytime you hear me preaching, I'm going to be talking about my color. Because they've made it an issue in America. For over 400 years, they enslaved people too because you are black. But in spite of that, a deranged white boy went into a church in our lifetime, sat down for Sunday school and shot people after Bible study. Do you know what amazed me about the beauty of our Christ? On the day they arraigned that boy, I listened because I was so pained. Every single survivor of that incident, the wife of the pastor that was killed, said, you have hurt me, you did badly, but I forgive you. The next person came again and said, you did this, you did that, you killed my husband, I forgive you. The next person came again, you did this, you did that, I forgive you. It is unnatural. But it's crucial. Because those people are able to move on with their lives. They are not allowing this demon to take them to hell with them. Do you get what I'm saying? Your life is in your own hands. The person that hurts you is evil. If that person does not repent, that person will go to hell. But if you are not careful, they will take you to hell with them. And if that person is an agent of Satan, which most likely they are, if you are not careful, the evangelism that Satan put that person on earth to do, the person has won. Forgiving others is not for them, it's for you. The Bible says that if you stand praying, Mark eleven twenty five. 25, it says forgive. If you have anything against anybody, it says so that your father who is in heaven may also forgive you. It's a conditioned precedent 
for your prayers to be answered. Some people say, why are my prayers not answered? The devil is excited because he knows that man in his natural state will fall for this. In his natural state, he will hate. So the devil will make sure that somebody hurts you. When your spouse hurts you, it's not because your spouse is a devil. Because Satan is a spirit. And Satan can use any vessel that allows itself to be used. Peter was used of Satan. But he recovered. Saul of Tarsus was used of Satan. But he recovered and became Paul. Even Moses killed an Egyptian. Used of Satan. He recovered. Abraham was used of Satan. And he recovered. So because somebody hurts you, does not mean that person cannot change. Your job is to recognize that there is something in you if you are a child of God. And that thing, the Bible simply says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And if Christ is in you, then that Christ is the hope of glory for you. And then if Christ is not in that person, like Jesus said to Peter, Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. Then that means you must recognize that when somebody you love is doing something that you hate to you, it is the devil that has entered into that person. And then instead of you fighting, because the Bible says the, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Those weapons are spiritual weapons. The Bible encourages you, after doing everything, stand. Stand for your marriage. I was doing marriage counseling for someone the other day. And I was reminding them that even people in the secular world, some of them have made up their mind they are not going to divorce. If you can do that in the secular world, and what came to my mind was someone like, Beyonce, who doesn't preach that she's a pastor? And Jay-Z, who doesn't preach that he's a saint? But I can imagine that someone, probably Beyonce, had decided in her heart, uh, Jay-Z, you ain't going nowhere. It's a ride or die. We, we, we're here together. And if they can battle each other in their marriage, in their secular marriage, and stay together, then you call yourself Christians. You say, Pastor, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Ah, I, can't take, I can't take it no more. And the same you, you went to the altar. Nobody called you. You called me all the time. Pastor, we are getting married. I said, glory be to God. Did I choose the husband for you? You say, no. Did I choose the wife for you? You say, no. Have you decided, both of you, for this reason, a man will leave his father and join with his father and mother's house and cleave on to his wife? The Bible did not say a boy and a girl. The Bible says a man and a woman. So this man and this woman, they choose a date. The first thing that even makes me upset with you is that on the day you chose, I didn't choose it for you, you are late. That shows, number one, you are not serious. Because if you are serious, you, you come to a grown man like me and tell me, pastor, we want to get married what's today? November 15. November 15, 2021. Not even 20. Okay. I say, okay. You say, can you do it in church? I say, fine. You say, I say, what time? You say, four o'clock. I say, it's four o'clock, fine by you. You say, yes. I now go and cancel every day. Somebody say, Pastor, we want you to win a million dollars on November 15, 20. I say, I can't do it. I have to be at this wedding. Ah, Pastor, we want you to come and get a house um, free of, I say, ah, I can't do it because I'm get, doing something. Oh, Pastor, we want you to go to Oklahoma for this. I say, no, I can't do it. So I change my life for you, both of you. Then on that day, I will show up here. If it was 4 o'clock, everybody in this church knows I'll be here by 1. I'm not the engineer. I'll be doing sound check, making sure everything is good. Then you show up at 6. Then if I'm, I do anything bad, they say, that pastor is no good. I mean, only 2 hours, or they were only late 1 hour. What's wrong with you? That already shows you are not serious. I already see that your marriage is not even... You will need some pillars and some piling to, to help because you are not serious. But that's not my... 
both of you decide and then you come before someone like me. I say, oh, you're looking so beautiful. You spend all the money in the world on the hair, on the makeup. Even me, I don't recognize some of you when you are getting married. You have to tell me that this is, hey, Sister G, I didn't know you are looking like this. You are looking like Chinese. But we give glory to God. But once they tell me it's you, I believe because I don't recognize you. No problem. Both of you now join together. But on that day, we say, I, Mr. This, Miss This, take you to be my beloved wife, lawful wedded wife, to have and to hold, for richer, for poorer, in sickness as in health, as long as we both shall live till death do us part. Then you add the insult. You say, so help me God. Then you call me to say, I now pronounce you by the authority bestowed upon me by the redeemed Christian church of God and the state of New York, I pronounce you husband and wife. Then you kiss, we celebrate. One year after you say, pastor, I can't take it anymore. How do you think that makes me feel? If I feel bad, after I counsel you, I will still go to my wife. But how do you think God feels? God looks at that person as a liar. And the number one reason for divorce, unforgiveness. I can't take it anymore. He betrayed me. She betrayed me. If you can agree to be true Christians, the Bible did not say men forgive wives or wives forgive husbands. The Bible says be tender hearted to one another. When one of you, your head is not in the right place, let the other ones be stable. Be the anchor. When you get into a marriage, say, I will never divorce. Have the attitude. I used to tease my wife and she knows I'm telling her the truth. I say, if you go with somebody else, tell the person to, she's marrying not just you, we marry me too. I'm, it's too, I'm not going nowhere anymore. It's too late. We go where? For what? We are going together. Even if she says she doesn't love me, we will now love that new person together. Buy one, get one free. <laughs> uh, offend me? You can't offend me again. One of our pastors here of Blessed Memory, Pastor Banure. In my office there, somebody did something. I was so upset and we called him. He, he, God just brought him to the church so I told him what happened. And he sat with us. And he told me that. That was what that was his life. He said, you have to get to a level with God where nobody can offend you anymore. You have to make up your mind. And he told me. He said one day God led him in a trance to imagine that his wife was having a relationship with somebody else was, and he caught them in bed. Not that it happened. He's just saying that God led him. And so he said he felt such pain. He felt such revulsion. He was so angry. And God said, that's the same way I get angry and disgusted and, and just my skin begins to crawl when you sin against me. That's just a test. Go and read the book of Hosea. You'll get a better understanding. He said, God now said, forgive. Ah, he said, God, I can't. <laughs> ah, I love you. He said, then that means you don't love me. You have no part in me. He said, then he understood what God was saying. That that means that anybody that has offended you, if you want to make heaven, this is why Jesus was the one that taught the Lord's prayer, not, not Paul. He says, forgive us our trespasses. As we, the conditioned precedent for God forgiving you has never changed. He says, as you forgive those who trespass, let's remove trespass, forgive me my sins, forgive me my offenses, only to the extent that I forgive others. You cannot make heaven without forgiveness. Your prayers cannot be answered. I'm not cursing you. I'm telling you why forgiveness is crucial. Taking Holy Communion cannot work. Some people say, you, when, you are, when we are doing Holy Communion, it says, some of you are sick. That when you take Holy Communion, you will recover. And then people say, but God, uh, Pastor, some people have been sick. They've been taking Holy Communion. They didn't recover. I don't know their details. Why is God not answering prayers? I don't know your details. 
But I know what the word of God says. The word of God says he's sovereign. Number one, he can do as he pleases. But number two, it says that the prayer of someone who refuses to forgive does not even reach heaven. It's just an exercise in prayer exercise. The Bible even goes to the extent that if you come to the altar and you want to give your offering and you remember that I've not forgiven Mr. Patrick, that I hate him, I want to kill him because of what he did to me. The Bible says, take that offering back and put it in your pocket because it's a waste of money. This woman whose son was killed petitioned for them to release the murderer and bring the murderer into her house. She lost a son and gained a son. But through her testimony, she gained millions for Christ. Because anywhere that message is being preached, anyone that knows of that woman will say there was a woman. And anywhere she speaks, somebody's heart will be touched. And that person will give their life to Christ. Christ is not about the size of your cross. It's not about the tattoo on your body that says, in Christ I trust, or on your money, or on, on you knowing how to recite. Uh, John 4, 4, John 5, 4. I don't know how to recite it. The one I know, I know. The one I don't know, God will help me. God is in your heart. It's not what you say, it's what you do. I know it's difficult. But it's for your own good. If you do not forgive others, Matthew 6, 15, neither will your father forgive you your trespass. It's not may, it is if you don't. Luke 6, 27, as I close. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Don't let anybody preach any other message to you that's a lie. It's not that it is easy. Make no mistake, God did not say take your head and put it down for your enemy to cut it off. He's just saying don't allow their evil to go in you. Let them go. There are some people you have to let go out of your life. Cut them off. Forgive them. Be praying for them because when they change, they will be a blessing to you. The same soul, the same soul that was consenting to the death of Stephen, the same soul that the Bible described as causing havoc in the church, the same Saul that went to get letters to be able to persecute Christians even further. That same Saul on the road to Damascus had an encounter that changed his life. And even though the apostles were afraid of him, once they knew Christ was in him, they accepted him and forgave him. Never again in the Bible did we hear about Saul of Tarsus. We continue to hear about Paul. Because old things have passed away. He's a God of loving kindness. He's a God of tender mercies. In the Old Testament, God told Abraham, leave your father's house, leave your brethren, leave your kindred, go to a place that I will show you. On the way to that place, Abraham had a, Abraham had a change of heart. He decided to use his own wisdom and he went to Egypt where they did not send him. Disobedience number one. When he got to Egypt, the Bible tells us that he had to lie that his wife was his sister, although technically it was, but we know what we're talking about. He was his wife. And God saved him again. And then the Bible says when he was living, he took many people with him. And we now know by deduction that one of those many people was Haggai. And then he went back to obey God and went to Canaan. And when he got to Canaan, God said, don't worry, I'm going to give you a son. 
He said, God, you are taking too long. Then he said, God, you can't do it again. I have accepted. Then he lied on his wife like all of us like to lie. He said, it's his wife that told him. When your wife told you, why did you say no? Just like Adam and Eve. Adam wanted the apple. Eve was just the conduit for him to eat it and have no blame. Your wife said, we are going the wrong direction. You say, no, we are not. You keep going round in circle. Round. Then later you say, it's your fault. You should have told me we are going the wrong direction. Man has never changed. But that same Haggai is the one that gave him Ishmael. That same Ishmael is the father of the Arabs today who is still the terror to Isaac who is the child of promise today. The same sin that Abraham started with. But by the time we go to Hebrews 11, when God is talking about Abraham, when his name has been changed from Abraham to Abraham, God did not even mention that Abraham lied. God did not even mention that Abraham sinned. Why? Because once God blots it away, once you come back to the throne of grace, that place where you can obtain mercy, once you come back to Jesus and you say, Lord, I'm sorry. I have sinned against you in my thoughts, in my words, and in my actions. Once you say, accept me back into the fold, God does not forgive like man forgives and says, I forgive and I don't forget. God blots it away as if it never happened. God does not even remember that Abraham sinned. God just remembered that Abraham is a father of faith. And in Hebrews 11, God began to use Abraham as the example of faith. Because God has forgotten the sins of Abraham. If God can blot away the sins of Abraham, if God can blot away the sins of Saul, of Tarsus, then God can blot away your sins. And if God can blot away your sins, he's saying that if you don't forgive others, that he will not forgive you. The only condition for you to make heaven, the reason why forgiveness is crucial, is that no matter how difficult it is, no matter how painful it is, no matter how much you struggle with it. It's not by your power. It's not by your might. It's only by the grace of God. And if you don't invite Jesus to come into your life, if you don't say, Jesus, help me to forgive and to forget and to let go. If you hold on to hatred, the hatred poisons you. If you hold on to anger, the anger poisons you. If you hold on to, to violence, it will not do you any good. I want you to rise to your feet. Don't give offering today if there's somebody you have not forgiven. Don't pray today except to pray that God should grant you the grace to forgive. That precious blood, the blood of Jesus, you can come up. I think your people are looking at you. There's a precious blood. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And for you to enjoy that blood, for you to benefit from that blood, you have to forgive. 